Hi, and welcome back to Columbia Physics Preceptor Television. Today I will be giving an example introduction for the uncertainty and error experiment. Uh, so welcome to 1291 lab. The first lab that we'll be doing in this course is a lab looking at uncertainty and error in measurements. In physics or in any experimental science, uh, engineering, medicine, uh, any science where we're doing experiments to measure some physical number, uh, we would like to get certainly that number, measure it, but we'd also like to get some sort of uh, value for how confident we are that that's the number, the true number that we've found or that we've measured. Uh, to describe this confidence level, we use uncertainty and error. Uh, whenever you make a measurement, it's not always perfect. It's not always absolute. If you make that measurement multiple times, you're very likely to get a range of values. Uh, to describe this range, you can use uh, another number, a second number, called the uncertainty on the measurement. Oftentimes, you'll see measured quantities written as, say, uh, 170 plus or minus 5. This is the scientist's way of saying that the best value we found for our measurement is 170. But if someone else were to do this measurement a few times, they would probably find a value like 173 or 168 within five units of the central measurement that they've made. Uh, there are different sources to this number, this uncertainty on a value. They come from two classifications of sources. The first source of error is called random error. Random error occurs in almost every measurement. It simply stems from the fact that when you make a measurement a number of times, you will get different values based on factors that you cannot control, whether it's the temperature of the room causing a table to grow or shrink, um, or random factors in the reaction time of a person to a stimulus. Uh, you can't control random error, but you can measure it. Measure it. Random errors will cause, uh, say we're trying to get to one certain value in xy plane. Random errors will cause different values to be evenly distributed around that value. Some will be very close, but not all will be directly on the center. The other kind of error is systematic. Systematic error, much like how it sounds, is predictable. It's always the same every time. For a systematic error, say we're trying to make the same xy measurement, the, the measurement of a position of a point, uh, a systematic error will cause all of the measurements that we've taken to be skewed by a certain amount. So instead of finding everything localized around the center, around the origin of our axes, all of our measurements will be precisely 10 centimeters off. This kind of error can also be uh, quantized, and if it is measured accurately enough, it can actually be subtracted away to a certain confidence level. I've said that all these sources of error can be measured. Well, how do we go about doing that? There are a few different methods, some stemming from our experimental procedure, others from statistical methods that we can apply to our data. The first is just by looking at the granularity or the resolution of the device that we're using to make a measurement. This can be a ruler or a dial on a voltmeter. Whatever we're using, we can say that the granularity of that device, uh, say I'm making a measurement with a ruler, of an object, and that object falls uh, between 10 inches and 11 inches, and the ruler is finally subdivided down to uh, two tenths of an inch. When we use the granularity of, or when we observe the granularity of this ruler, we can see that there is no, av or there is no precise value that we can assign to the very end of this, of the object. But we can say that, uh, we, we can estimate it. Say that it's uh, 10.5 inches, but then we'd also like to assign an uncertainty to it based on the granularity of the lines on that ruler. We know that 
the, the object cannot be greater than 10.6 and it cannot be less than 10.4 simply by where it's fallen between those fine lines on the ruler. The spread between those two points, or rather half of it, is one-tenth of an inch. So we can say that our object is 10.5 plus or minus 0.1 inches. If we're measuring something multiple times, we can use what's called the two-thirds method. This is based on the statistical assumption that when you measure something many, many times, all of your values should fall around the true value, but they will have some random distribution that follows a Gaussian curve. You may have heard of it uh, described as a bell curve, simply because it looks like a bell. There are more rigorous statistical models that go along with the Gaussian curve, but what we can say is that two-thirds of our data should fall within one uncertainty level of the actual value. So if our value here is 10.5, if we make multiple measurements of them, of, of the length of this object, two-thirds of them should fall within 10.6 or 10.4 since we've assigned it an uncertainty envelope of 0.1 inches. If we're doing an experiment that involves counting the number of times that an object happens, say in a random process like uh, the decay of an atomic nucleus, we can say that the uncertainty on the number of counts observed goes like the square root of the observed number. Say in a certain amount of time t, 100 counts are observed. The confidence level on this would then be plus or minus 10 counts. 10 is simply the square root of 100. You should also keep in mind whenever you're making measurements uh, that the significant digits of the quoted value should correspond rather well with the uncertainty. If I were to say that this ruler is, oh, say 10.52378 plus or minus 0 0.1 inches, this is really nonsensical. All of these digits here are factors of 10 and 100 smaller than my uncertainty. So really, I only care about the 0.5. When I do my calculations, I can simply drop these digits off and truncate so that my answer, or so that my reported measurement is 10.5 plus or minus 0.1. It should be noted that there are different ways of writing and expressing uncertainty. First, as I've shown so far in uh, this introduction, there's been, uh, I've been using a form called absolute uncertainty. Here we have a measurement plus or minus some absolute value. I can also express this as a relative uncertainty value. The way I would write that is to write my measured value, in this case 10.5, and then multiply it times simply one plus or minus a quantity called the relative uncertainty. The relative uncertainty is just the absolute uncertainty divided by the original measurement. In this case, this would be 0 0.01 approximately. If you're comfortable or if you're used to uh, dealing with percent error, this is simply an expression of the percent error on this value. Here I have approximately a 1% error. During the course of the semester, you will have to take measurements and propagate them through certain equations and calculations in order to get a final answer. Today, for example, you'll be measuring uh, reaction time based on the distance that a ruler drops through someone's hand. You can predict how far something falls in a certain amount of time, but in order to get back to that time uh, from the measured positions, you need to put those numbers through an equation. Now we get to, or to deal with this, we look at certain techniques for what are, what's called propagating error. Uh, say I have, or, and these can be grouped by different, the different types of mathematical functions that we're using on the numbers. Say for example, I have uh, an operation of A plus B equals C. And each of these measurements have a certain uncertainty along with them, sigma A, sigma B, and sigma c. 
if this is a plus sign or a minus sign, I can express the uncertainty on C as simply an addition or the sum of the absolute errors of A and B. If I am multiplying or dividing, say, A times B equals C, in this case, I don't use the absolute uncertainty. I would add the relative uncertainties. So the relative uncertainty of C is the relative uncertainty of A plus the relative uncertainty of B. Further, uh, if, for example, I have to take a square root, say the square root of A is equal to C. In this case, the uncertainty on C, the relative uncertainty on C, I should say, is just the relative uncertainty of A divided by 2. This is not the most rigorous method for handling uncertainty and propagating error, but it does, it actually slightly overestimates the uncertainties and should be good enough for the purposes of our laboratory investigations. So today you'll be looking at, uh, you'll have practice propagating, on, or propagating error through two different experimental methods. In the first case, you'll use a pendulum of length L with a mass M on the string. And you'll let it swing back and forth a few times. And as it swings, you'd like to use a stopwatch to measure the period of the pendulum, how long it takes to go through one full cycle of oscillation. Mathematically, we can express this as 2 pi over the period is equal to the square root of the gravitational constant g divided by the length of the pendulum. But like all good scientists, we would like to measure this for sure. What you should do is take 24 measurements of the uh, period of the pendulum. This, uh, you should start it swinging and then measure it 24 times independently. Uh, what you, <clears throat> you will then use the 2 thirds method to calculate the uncertainty on that set of values. You should draw some sort of histogram where if the times falls into certain bins, this would be all time between uh, 1 seconds, 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, and add or draw sort of a bar graph showing the number of measurements that have fallen between each of these times. You then use the two-thirds method to find what the uncertainty or where two-thirds of those data uh, fall within on the number line so that you can estimate uh, a measurement of the period of the pendulum along with an uncertainty. You should do this through two different methods. The first one by seeing where the pendulum, or by measuring uh, starting and stopping the stopwatch when the pendulum reaches its maximum height. The second time, you should start and stop the stopwatch when the pendulum passes through a fixed point say, uh, looking at a line between the tiles on the floor and seeing when the pa pendulum passes through, the, or passes through that line. The second investigation is measuring reaction time. In this case, one of the lab members will hold a meter stick by the end, and the other person will put their hand around, but don't grab onto uh, the meter stick around the 50 centimeter mark. The first, lab, or the first member of your lab group will then drop the meter stick and the second person will try to catch it as quickly as possible, sort of measuring their reaction time. You should do this about 9 or 12 times per each student. Uh, you can see that I'm using numbers which are multiples of 3. This will make your 2 thirds analysis much easier than using uh, arbitrary numbers. You will then take the distance that the ruler has fallen, say s, and use the free fall equation, 1 half g t squared, to find the average reaction time and the uncertainty on that reaction time for each lab partner. Uh, you should have plenty of time to complete both of these investigations. Uh, have fun.